In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation, and as always, it's uh, great to be with all of you. We'd like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is truly the Mother of God, which is her greatest title. Mary is also the Mother of the Church, also, Mary is known, Mary is our mother too. When we pray the Hail Holy Queen, we start off by invoking Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's invite Mary to be with us, to pray for us, and to pray with us, and draw us closer to her Son, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's pray the prayer that Mary loves most, and that is the Hail Mary. Together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour <coughs> of our death. Amen. Excuse me. So now we'd like to invite to be with us we'd like to be with us our spiritual our spiritual guide. And our spiritual guide is the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit has many wonderful titles. Holy Spirit is the Paraclete. He's also known as the Gift of Gifts. The Holy Spirit is also known as the Sweet guest of the soul. Holy Spirit is also known as the sanctifier. Holy Spirit is also known as our interior master, our interior master or teacher. St. Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's uh, beg the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light in our intellect. Let's pray also the Holy Spirit will give us a lot of fire, fire to burn within our hearts. So let's pray the prayer, the classical prayer of the Holy Spirit, and that is, Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of God, Mother of the Church, pray for us. 
St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We welcome all of you, the family that prays together, stays together, how true that is. And encourage you, I promise to pray for you and all of your intentions in the greatest of all prayers. And the greatest of all prayers, my friends, is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's right. The holy sacrifice of the Mass is by far the greatest of all prayers. So I celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass today. I'd like to place all of you on the altar that God would rain down abundant blessings upon you, your family, and all your undertakings today. As the psalmist points out, give, Lord, give success to the work of our hands. Lord, give success to the work of our hands. So my first intention will be that, related to the first reading today, Hebrews, which quotes not Psalm ninety-five, that we would listen to the vo we would listen to the voice of God. That we would be docile to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit today. Hopefully, we'll pray. This prayer often, come Holy Spirit, come, come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be I'd like to pray for you and your families. Many of you, your spouses, as well as your, your children, <coughs> especially I'd like to pray for the children who have walked away from, from God, from the church, and from the practice of the faith, that the Holy Spirit would enlighten them so that they understand that true happiness True happiness, we're all seeking for happiness. But true happiness can only be found in our union with God. Then my third intention will be, I'd like to pray for the conversion of sinners, but especially I'd like to pray for the conversion of sin, I'd like to also to pray for deathbed sinners. For those who will be dying today, especially those who are not in the state of grace. My friends, when all is said and done, the only thing that really matters in our life is to get to heaven. As our Lord said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? And St. Ignatius reminds us in principle and foundation, we are created to praise God, to reverence God, to serve God in this life so as to be happy with God forever in heaven. So let's pray for the conversion of deathbed sinners, that they will be saved. Great, my friends. 
As always, it's great to be with all of you. So, I'd like to start off with the story and then we can enter into the riches of the Word of God. This story maybe you've heard before, but it's worth repeating. There is a man standing out in the public square And it started to rain. And he was a believer and he said, Lord, help me. I don't know how to swim. So the rain came pouring down and got up to his knees and he said, Lord, help me. I don't want to drown. So a man in a rowboat came by and said, you better get it. You better get in because it's supposed to be raining for a couple of days. He said, no, God will help me. So the rain was pouring down in buckets. The man said, Lord, help me. And the rain was already up to his, his, uh, his chest. So a, a ship passed by and said, you better get in. You're going to drown. The man said, no, God will help me. So it was raining harder and harder. And a man, a helicopter, came over him because it was already over his head. He threw a rope and said, grab onto it. He said, grab onto the rope, we'll pull you up. The man said, no, God will help me. And he drowned. So when he went before the Lord, the man said, Lord, why didn't you help me? The Lord said, well, I sent you a rowboat, a canoe, a motorboat, a ship, and I sent you a helicopter. What more did you want? I like that story because how often has it happened in our lives? How has it happened in our lives that God seems, God is knocking at the door of our hearts and we don't seem to recognize God knocking at the door of our hearts. Revelation chapter 3. The word of God says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Whoever opens up to me, I will sit down and dine with him, and he will dine with me. Holman Hunt painted that, that depiction. Someone complained saying, why did you paint the, the doorknob outside the door as the good shepherd is there with his staff in hand and the lantern? And he said, I purposely did not paint the doorknob from without because the doorknob is, is from within. So those stories and that artistic depiction is a good entrance into our topic today. Now, in ordinary time, the church offers us the letter to the Hebrews, which is basically quoting Psalm 95. Today, if you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your hearts, as they did in Meribah and Mas in the desert. So the letter of the Hebrews is basically summarizing Psalm 95, which is the invitatory psalm that we pray in the liturgy of the hours in the morning. And then we have the gospel today, and we're reading still through Mark chapter 1. Over the past couple of days, we've had Jesus casting out devils and Jesus working many miracles by healing the sick. And he's preaching also in the synagogue. Those are the three primary works that our Lord carried out in his public life, abundant preaching, 
miracles of healing as well as miracles over nature. And Jesus is also casting out devils. He's doing exorcisms. So today, we have our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ carrying out another miracle. This time our Lord, he meets up with a leper. This leper comes to the Lord and he kneels down and he says, Lord, if you will, you can heal me. Jesus moved. He moved by seeing this piteous sight of this leper. To compassion, he says, I do will it. <coughs> and our Lord touches the leper. And the leprosy disappears right away. The leper is healed right away. Jesus tells him not to tell anyone about it, but rather to go to the priest and offer what the Mosaic law prescribed. But what happens is uh, the man cannot keep his joy to himself, so he's announcing it far and wide, the fact that our Lord healed his leprosy. Consequently, our Lord could not go into the cities, but he had to stay on the outskirts. But still, people were coming to him from all sides. He was attracting so many people. Attracting so many people. So there we have in a nutshell a panoramic eagle's eye view of the readings for today. So let's go to the first reading. The Holy Spirit says, Oh, that today you would hear his voice. That you would hear his voice. How many times has it happened that God is speaking to us but we're deaf to his call? I like to call this I like to call this se selective hearing or selective listening. How often does it happen that God speaks to us as in the story of the man that drowned and we don't hear or sometimes we simply don't want to hear. Sometimes we simply don't want to hear. Here's another scenario I'd like to present to you. Many of you have children some of them are, are teenagers. Try to, try to uh, depict this scene. So it's, uh, it's Saturday morning. The children don't have school. And you tell your two teenagers, hey, get up now, it's already 11 o'clock in the morning. Get up, make your bed. Also, clean your room. Take out the trash. And then clean the bathroom.
all of a sudden you find that your children don't seem to, to, to hear what you said, even though you've said it loud and clear. You said it loud and clear, and also you've said it, you already, you already had to say it three times. Then you decide another tactic. You say, you know, today is Saturday, and I was thinking of taking you to Disney. Then after that, we would go to Chuck E. Cheese, or we go to you go to Chuck E. Cheese, or Baskin Robbins. All of a sudden, you're two teenagers. It's almost as if their deafness has disappeared. They're out of their beds. They make their beds. One of them rushes to throw the trash in the dumpster. The other one is working hard to clean the bathroom. Within five minutes, they say, we're ready, Mom. When are we going to be going to Disney? And then when are we going to be going to Chuck E. Cheese? I think that's very, very interesting. Because first, when you repeat it to them three times to get out of bed, to make their bed, to take the trash out, and to and to clean the bathroom, it's almost as if they were deaf. Almost as if they were deaf. But then, when you said we're going to go to Disney, and then after Disney we will go to Chuck E. Cheese or Baskin Robbins, their hearing was restored. And maybe you said, I don't believe in miracles. There you see a miracle of two teenagers that happen to be your son and your daughter. When you decide to tell them we're, we're going to go, we're going to go to Disney and their, their hearing is, is actually perfect. That is called, that is called selective listening. It's called selective hearing. How often, how often that has it happened to us? How often has it happened to us that we also, we listen, we hear, and we understand what we want to? So the first reading today, <coughs> commenting upon Psalm 95 says, Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in Meribah and Massa in the desert, when they rebelled against me. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Another story of all related to our topic, and then we'll talk about how is it how is it that God speaks to us? How is it that God speaks to us? So the next story is the following. It's the following. There's a new priest, new pastor that is there at the Sunday Mass, his first Sunday Mass. And he welcomes the people. Then he gives a homily. 
and the homily that he gives really moves the people. Then he greets the people after Mass, and they say, Welcome, Father. Very good homily. Thank you very much. The following day, <coughs> the following day, following day, rather following Sunday, he gives, he gives the same homily. And they thought, that's pretty good. As they say, don't quit a winner. The third Sunday, he gives the same homily. And they thought that was wise because it was so good that people should hear it a couple of times. For Sunday, he preaches the same homily. And they say, well, we've heard it four times. Uh, we're, we're really getting to know it. Now, what happens is that he ends up by giving this homily ten Sundays in a row. After the 10th homily, after Mass, these two old ladies in tennis shoes comes up. They come up to him. And they say, Father, we have to admit that your homily that you've given the past 10 Sundays is very good. It's a very good homily, and we've heard it 10 times. So given that we have heard it ten times, can you give us a new one? The new pastor said, I will give you the new one, but under the condition that you try to put into practice the first homily that I preached to you. It's a good story. And hopefully you got the drift. Hopefully got the drift. And the drift is the following. That how, how often have we have we heard something to we heard something but It didn't seem to register. We didn't really seem to understand. Or maybe as the story of the two teenagers who did not hear the mother saying, get out of bed, make your bed, clean your room, take out the trash. Then the mother said, hey, we're going to go to Disney and Chuck E. Cheese and Baskin Robbins. All of a sudden they heard very clearly. Maybe it is such, maybe it is such that we simply don't want to hear at times. So, sometimes we prefer to be both blind and deaf. Here is a, here's a, here's a Spanish, Spanish Mexican proverb. This is a good one, and it's No en peor ciego que aquel que no quiere ver. No en peor sordo que aquel que no quiere oír. Okay, that's uh, a very pretty famous Mexican proverb, Spanish proverb, that some of you are bilingual, but I'll translate it for you. And it says, there's no worse blind person than the blind person that doesn't want to see. There's no worse deaf person than the deaf person that doesn't want to hear.
I repeat, there is no worse blind person than the blind person that doesn't want to, doesn't want to see. No worse deaf person than the deaf person that does not want to hear. So, I think this is the attitude that we should have. It's the attitude of, of the young Samuel that we have in the temple. The young Samuel was in the temple of Shiloh. He had a room there, and next to him was the priest Eli. Samuel he heard a voice, and he thought that it was Eli speaking to him. So he got up and he said, Here I am, you called me. Eli said, I didn't call you, go back to bed. This happened three times, and then finally, then finally, Eli, the priest serving as the spiritual director, recognized that God was speaking to Samuel. So he says to Samuel, okay, next time, next time you hear that voice, respond as such, speak, speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord, for your servant is listening. Sometimes we don't want to see and we don't want to hear. We should ask God to take the blinders off our eyes and the wax out of our ears. As a kid, I remember I used to watch these intellectual programs. I used to watch The Little Rascals and The Three Stooges. Remember one occasion, Curly was standing next to Mo, and he said, Mo, Mo, I can't see, I can't see, I can't see. And Mo said, why can't you see? And Curly said, because I have my eyes closed. It's kind of corny humor, right? It's kind of corny, slapstick comedy or humor, but there's something in that. There's something in that because how often, how often we have our eyes closed and our ears closed and we simply don't want to hear. We simply don't want to hear. So, I'd like to give you I'd like to give you some suggestions, ways to understand how God how God communicates to us. How God communicates to us. You know, how God speaks to us. Now, what I'm going to say is very applicable to you as parents. You're going to like what I, you're going to like what I say, but perhaps your children will not. So I'll, 
I'll say it to you. I think you as moms and dads and some of your grandparents will like what I say. I've used this in homilies to uh, the, uh, the children in First Communion. And the parents love it, but the little kids don't like it that much. And it's this. They ask the children, have you ever heard God speak to you? They're looking at me. I don't think so. Are you sure? You've never heard God speak to you? Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? And they're looking at me. They say, okay, did you ever hear this these words get out of bed now it's time to go to school that's god speaking to you did you ever hear this voice make your bed and clean your room you ever hear those words that's god speaking to you did you ever hear these words Set the table, we're going to have dinner. That's God speaking to you. Did you ever hear this one? Turn off the TV, get off your phone, it's dinner time. Come on. It's God speaking to you. You ever hear this one? Stop fighting with your brother. God speaking to you. Everything this what? Go in your room and do your homework. That's God speaking to you. Maybe you heard this one. Come on now, it's time to pray the rosary. That's God speaking to you. What am I saying? God speaks to us, my friends, in many, many ways. But most specifically, God speaks to us. God speaks to us through his word and through the Ten Commandments. That's right. God speaks to us through his word but he also speaks through the Ten Commandments. So that many homily that I've given to you, that I've given to the children in my masses in the past, is I'm simply giving practical ways to interpret the commandments, specifically the, the Fourth Commandment. The fourth commandment is to honor your father and your mother. Jesus put it this way. Not all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but those who do the will of my heavenly father. Also, Jesus said, if you, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's right. If you love me, keep my commandments. So I invite all of you yeah, and maybe struggling with your children to maybe have them listen to the talk I'm giving to you now. It will be archived on YouTube as well as on Facebook. Listen to it again. God does speak in many ways, but he also speaks through the commandments. 
And if you like me to develop this a little bit more, I would suggest that you read with your children, that you read with your children, uh, Syrac chapter three. invite you to read Sirach chapter 3. That's one of the best chapters in the Bible on the family and on the blessings that come upon children that will obey their mo mother and father. Those who obey their parents will have a long life in the land of the living. It's a Wonderful chapter. And that Syrac chapter 3, more than once when parents come in to talk with me with their rebellious teenagers, I'll tell them, well, let's get the Bible and see what the Bible says. And I'll open up the Bible to Syrac chapter 3. And it's very clear that God will bless children that honor, respect, and obey their parents and do not abandon their parents in their old age. So, God speaks, God speaks God speaks through the Word of God, but also God speaks through the commandments, as well as through lawful authority. Okay, what is another way in which God will speak? Okay, God speaks also God speaks also through the church. Now, let me give you um, a really good example of this. Speaks through the church, through the word of God, and through the church, and through what is called the the magisterium. I'm listening to Father Mike's comment on the catechism and last yesterday, the uh, 11th day, he said that God speaks to us through the Bible, but also through tradition as well as through the magisterium. Magistra would be the teaching office of the church. So we have to have someone we have to read the Bible, but we have to have someone to interpret the Bible for us. Otherwise, we end up in the Protestant church with 40,000 different Protestant churches. Martin Luther said sola scriptura, that was in the 1500s. That never existed before, but rather we have the church to help us to give a proper interpretation. And I'll give you I'll give you one of the best examples of the importance of having the Bible but also the church to help us to have a proper interpretation of the Bible. And this is taken from the Acts of the Apostles. And what I'm trying to do today, my friends, in our conversation to see how does how does God speak to us and I've given you several stories already the man in the rain the new pastor the selective listening of the teenagers many stories God speaks but sometimes we don't want to hear or we're we're, we're tone deaf at certain times And this one is is taken from the Acts of the po Acts of the Apostles, 
and the person of Philip. Philip the deacon and the Ethiopian. So we got the Acts of Apostles, Philip the deacon with the Ethiopian. This, uh, this passage is very important to understand my message. Because we have to, it's not always easy, like Catherine Rivera has been asking us to help her to, to discern some important thing in her life. It's good that we go about our discernment process properly, and, and as Bev has pointed out, we have to have proper spiritual direction. This is, this is Ignatian spirituality. We all have blind spots. We all have deafness. We all have blind spots. We all have deafness. So here's the chapter. Maybe you remember it during the Easter season. We go through the book, the Acts, the Apostles, written by Saint Luke. So this, there's this uh, Ethiopian who is searching for the truth, kind of like the the wise men. He's uh, an Ethiopian. He's searching for the truth, and he's an Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch in in Candace. So he's traveling, he's traveling from his country to Jerusalem in the pursuit of the truth. And he's a man that's educated, he's able to read. When he's coming back from this pilgrimage, God tells Philip the deacon to run up beside the chariot of this Ethiopian and that God would in, arrange this encounter and bring a lot of good out of it. So Philip the deacon, who's very docile, runs up to the side of this Ethiopian in the chariot and he's running side by side. And the Ethiopian is in the chariot and he's actually reading the Bible. He's reading the prophet Isaiah. So Philip the deacon, he asks the Ethiopian if he understands what he's reading. And the Ethiopian says, <clears throat> how can I understand, how can I understand this unless someone explains it to me? How can I understand unless someone explains it to me? So the Ethiopian invites Philip the deacon to mount the chariot and they're sitting side by side and Philip is explaining the biblical passage, how it refers to Christ. And apparently Philip has spoken about the importance and necessity of baptism, being baptized by water. So as they're traveling along, the Ethiopian points out that there was some water on the side of the road. What prevents him from being baptized? So once again, Philip, very docile, Philip, who's very docile, open to the Holy Spirit, he descends 
into the water with the Ethiopian. Then he baptizes the Ethiopian. He baptized the Ethiopian. And then God takes Philip and snatches him and places him on another path. Then the Ethiopian who has become a new Christian being baptized by water and the Spirit, he returns to his country rejoicing to share this newly founded faith to the people in his own country. That is, my friends, a very, very important passage for us to understand how God speaks to us. This Ethiopian, this Ethiopian was searching for the truth. This Ethiopian was sincerely searching for the truth. He made a pilgrimage from his country to Jerusalem. On the way back, he's in his chariot. He's reading and meditating upon the prophet Isaiah. He willingly invites Philip to sit down to listen to him and to interpret, to interpret properly, properly the word of God, which is Isaiah. Then he receives baptism. So what I'm saying here, my friends, for us to hear properly the word of God, For us to hear properly the word of God and to implement it or to put it into practice. We have to read the word of God, but also we have to submit ourselves to the teaching office of the church. The teaching office of the church is also known as the magisterium. We do that, my friends. We are on, we are walking on solid ground. We're walking on solid ground. Jesus speaks about the house built on sand and then the house built on rock. The house built on sand and the house built on rock. The house built on sand are those who just follow their feelings and their opinions and they go with the flow of what the modern society and culture is teaching. That's heading toward disaster. Whereas the house built on rock, the house built on rock is Christ. St. Paul says that the Christ is the rock. He's the rock. He is our rock foundation. So my friends, today our, our message, our message is hopefully very clear for all of us. We're just commenting upon one verse which we have in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 7 to 14. And the book of Hebrews is actually commenting upon Psalm 95, which is all that today you would hear 
the voice of God. Harden not your hearts. Harden not your hearts. Fulton Sheen gives this image. The sun, the sun, the noonday sun shines down on wax and it shines down on mud. What does the sun do to the wax? It melts the wax. What does the sun do to the mud? It hardens the mud. Hopefully, my friends, we're like wax, allowing the sun of God's grace to penetrate us, to permeate us, to form us, to mold us, into the saints that God has called us to be. And may God bless you. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless all of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.